You ever have a movie that left you so conflicted that you can't seem to wrap your head around how you feel about it? Well, I've got several, but none of them quite as annoyingly as the 1965 war epic Battle of the Bulge. Now, that name is pretty... pretty infamous amongst war film buffs such as myself. So, so why am I so conflicted over it? This, this film is absolutely despised amongst the, the historical community, the, the, the film community, uh, you know, war film community, so on and so forth. Uh, well, chances are you already know why I am conflicted, because you've listened to a lot of my other stuff. And let's just say that Dwight Eisenhower himself publicly denounced the film for its historical inaccuracies. That should say it all right there, actually, but history buffs like me have all clamored to this movie as basically the ABCs of how not to do a historical film. Yet I also know that being 100% accurate to history can lead to a dull movie, and I look at the 2004 remake of The Alamo, that is such a boring movie. Yet, I also love John Wayne's The Alamo, which is extremely historically inaccurate. I've also reviewed movies where they are not overly historically accurate, but I still love them. Uh, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is The Bridge at Remagen. So I sat back and was wondering just why I could praise a film like that, The Bridge at Remagen, and also denounce a film like The Battle of the Bulge. And I started realizing that it all comes down to, does the film capture the spirit of the battle? Does it capture the true essence of what actually happened? And the bridge at Remagen certainly does that. For everything it did wrong historically, it makes up for it by getting right. The wrong explosives, the lack of German manpower, the bridge exploding but not falling, the Americans getting slaughtered on the bridge, the machine gun nets. I can go on and on about what the bridge at Remagen did right, but the Battle of Bulge doesn't even manage to do that. Yet I quite enjoy much of what the script had to offer. Thus, we have a bit of a conundrum here. A conundrum of the bulge, if you will. Because let's look at the real Battle of the Bulge. It took place over months, was not held in high esteem by the main commanders of the German army, uh, was in the middle of a heavily wooded area, horrific winter weather, lots of tanks. I could go on and on. Now let's look at the movie, made in 1965. You got the wrong tanks, the desert, flat terrain, takes place over 50 hours, no Patton, which pisses me off because that is seriously one of the ballsiest things to ever happen in World War II. No character in the film really exists. Ugh. Ugh. What do I like about this movie? For one, the cast is great. You got Robert Shaw, Robert Ryan, Henry Fonda, Telly Savalas, Hans Christian Blech. That's a great cast. And yes, they do bring genuine life to the written characters they portray, especially Robert Shaw. I also like how all the characters, despite them being separated, end up meeting even if they do not know each other. You know, you have Savalas uh, looking at Robert Ryan and saying, when are we going to fight? And then you have Henry Fonda being there uh, with the main LT at the end of the film, along with Savalas and the others. Henry Fonda hearing Robert Shaw over the radio. I always like scripts that do this, and this film is no exception. Oh, so let's talk about the tanks, because I like them. Sure, these aren't Tiger Twos, a.k.a. King Tigers. Those are beautiful, beautiful, but useless tanks. In this film, they use Spanish M48s. And the American Sherman tanks aren't Shermans at all, they are actually Chaffees. But even by 1965, most of those World War II era tanks were simply gone, and they certainly didn't have enough to fill the screen like the movie does with actual tanks. So the filmmakers, they did the next best thing. They focused on size differences and played it up. An M48 is certainly much bigger and more opposing than the low-running Chaffee. And yeah, that's actually pretty accurate to a King Tiger tank versus a Sherman. So the filmmakers at least knew what was happening. And let's face it, tanks are fucking awesome. And this film has lots of them. It's truly an epic of tanks. In fact, I've, I've hardly seen any other movies except a couple of Soviet films to have this many tanks on screen at one time. And it's extremely impressive. Seeing hundreds of them on screen at once firing and battling each other it's a great spectacle. And we already hail movies like Patton, which used M48 tanks as tigers. So 
What makes this movie any different? Hell, even Saving Private Ryan didn't use real tigers. There were dressed up T-34s. Just look at the treads. Same with Band of Brothers. Speaking of tanks, the film also never depicts the ineffectiveness of the King Tiger. Hitler was an idiot. Well, no duh, right? But Hitler was a true idiot and thought bigger was always better. When in reality, the King Tiger was simply too heavy and underpowered, making it a massive piece of junk. And you can almost say the same thing of the regular Tiger as well, despite them being more formidable than the King Tiger. During the battle, they would often get stuck on roads, they collapsed bridges, they slowed down an already slow offensive. But then again, would have that been dramatic for the purpose of the film. The movie depicts King Tigers of a, as a tank that should be feared, and I suppose early on, I would say, yes, it would have been. Shermans didn't stand a chance against them, and the film wanted to focus on the fear of these gigantic tanks and the fear that it put into the Americans. I suppose showing them getting stuck and such would have deflated the threat of the Germans in terms of, in terms of dramaticism in the film, but I can't help but thinking of a possible potential that that could have also had as well. Have the character played by Telly Savalas seeing this happening, and he figures out their weakness. You can even do this in the middle of the battle. Make his character more important to the plot. But nope, none of it. Yet the film did fill me with fear as I watched the Tigers, M48s in the films, advance and simply run over the Americans, and that's what the filmmakers wanted to show more than anything else, and they did, in my opinion, extremely well. Also, the first part of the film did get many things right. You had the bad snowy weather, the mountainous terrain, the Germans dressed up as Americans causing trouble for the U.S., the inexperienced lieutenants filling the American lines out there, the lack of discipline because so many thought the war was over because it was around Christmas, the utter chaos once the Germans launched their attack actually caused, and of course, nuts. If you're a history buff, you'll understand what I mean by that. But there is just so damn much, so utterly inaccurate with this movie, to the point it's distracting. Really, really, really distracting. A part of me blames Philip Jordan, the writer, uh, sometimes known as Philip Jordan. Uh, he worked with Sam Bronston a lot, and I honestly don't think he's a good writer. He's the kind of writer who looks at an outline of something and just writes it to be entertaining for no other reason than just that, which isn't always bad for the record. That's fine with sci-fis or dramas or comedies. But a historical film? Not just that, but a, a, a historical epic, no less. It's insulting. And the inaccuracies in this movie are just that. Insults to the heroism and bravery at the real battle. In fact, Eisenhower would publicly denounce that. But these inaccuracies are a sin that greatly affects my ability to sit back and truly enjoy this movie. I cannot separate the historian in me and the moviegoer in me. And believe it or not, a lot of people when they sat and watched this film in theaters, they felt the same way. Because let's face it, a lot of them had actually fought in the battle or had relatives that had fought in the battle. I actually had relatives that fought in the battle under Patton. And Patton's not even in the movie. In fact, this entire film reeks of Sam Bronston. Though his company had gone under thanks to the failures of 55 Days of Peking and the fall of the Roman Empire, what he had created remained. The film opens with paintings overlaid by credits, like the Bronston flicks, shot in Spain like a Bronston flick, written by Bronston's main writer, had gargantuan set pieces, and used loads of Spanish soldiers as extras, which is why you see many of the Germans holding Spanish Mausers and not the actual German Car 98s that the Germans had used during the battle. Not that that's actually a complaint, that's more of a tidbit. The, the way you can immediately tell the difference between a Spanish Mauser and a Car 98 without even really paying attention is you look at the bolt. On a Spanish Mauser, the bolt is sticking straight out, and a German Car 98, the bolt is actually bending down. That's your main difference, but at least they're Mausers. Let's talk about the biggest inaccuracy of the movie, and that is the location. Hitler chose the Ardennes for a reason, and yes, the Battle of the Bulge was really Hitler's brainchild, which explains why it failed miserably. And it's because it's nasty, it's, it's just a nasty stretch of land. The towns are small, the roads are made of dirt, and it's heavily wooded, it's mountainous. It's how the Germans were able to run right past the French and British early on in the war. No one expected them to do this, but by late 1944, the whole plan was doomed to failure right from the start because, eventually, 
The nasty weather would go away. The Allied airstrikes would wipe them out, and by this time, the Luftwaffe was gone. I mean, it was a joke. If you saw, I believe it was white planes during the day, there would be British. If you saw dark planes, there would be American. If you saw no planes, there would be Luftwaffe. That was genuinely a joke going around in Germany at the time. The movie, Battle of the Bulge, begins in the hills and heavily forest areas, and despite there being little snow on the ground, I can actually take that because of all the mud and the overcast and it's just bleakness of the weather. And again, that movie, the beginning of this movie really does play that right. But then to end in a fucking desert? What the actual fuck? It's flat. There's arid terrain everywhere. This doesn't even look like France. It's not even foggy or overcast. It's, br it's a bright sunny day when the tanks are attacking each other. I would have e possibly even accepted the fact that if, if it was foggy, and you couldn't see the sun or anything like that. It was just bleak like it was at the beginning of the movie. But no, no, bright and sunny. Bright and sunny. So if you're looking at this by the logic the film actually sets, why aren't the Americans bombing the shit out of the Germans like they did in reality? Yet I'm not gonna lie, the tank battle is extremely well done, both with editing, music, and especially cinematography. Even the miniatures are outstanding. And an interesting bit of trivia, these are done by Eugene Lorre. Uh, best known as the director for both Beast 20,000 Fathoms and Gorgo. But back to an inaccuracy, where the fuck is Patton? I like the bravery they depict of the American soldiers fighting for sure, but fuck, Patton saving those soldiers trapped by the encircled Germans was, was amazing, it was daring, it was ballsy, and goddamn awesome. Something to make you go, fuck yeah. The film Patton actually far better displays the actual Battle of the Bulge, and it's only a small segment of that damn film. It's why I want a genuine movie about the real Battle of the Bulge. It's one of the reasons why I actually really enjoy Jeff Shera's book. Instead, here, we focus on people who not only didn't exist in real life, but aren't even accurate in their depictions of the situations they found themselves in. Henry Fonda, F Henry Fonda finding the tank column is a good scene depicting how the Germans used the bad weather to their advantage, sure. But why only that scene? In reality, the Germans were just as lost as the Americans, slipping past a fuel depot by only a few hundred feet. Piper, instead of flanking the Americans and encircling them completely, making utter chaos, he got lost and just kept pushing straight forward. He slipped right past the Americans. Imagine if that was in the film, the music building in tension as the Germans approach, only to then slip past it. I could, I could see tons of potential in that. Just imagine if the Germans had even gotten the fuel. It, it wouldn't have won them the war by any stretch of the imagination, but it could have elongated the war by maybe even half a year at most. That's a lot of dead people in that time. This is what irks me here about Battle of the Bulge made in 1965. That stuff is so dramatic and so tense, and this film just didn't care. We have a fuel depot, sure, but we never used them to stop the King Tigers. And certainly the... Colonel Hessler character, who's supposed to be Colonel Piper in reality, wasn't killed during the battle. He was assassinated several years later in the 1970s. Fuel is actually, I personally think, the number one thing this film actually manages to get right. One of the big things. I love how Henry Ponda finds out that the Germans are low on fuel. I love how they play that into the plot with General Grey played by Robert Ryan, sacrificing his armor to simply make the Germans spend their gas. Petrol is blood, that Hessler says at the very beginning of the movie, foreshadowing how important it is later in the film. Or uh, Henry Fonda capturing a bunch of these young soldiers carrying uh, these rubber hoses. Those are to siphon gas. Again, this is all foreshadowed and set up in the plot, and I genuinely like that. And, and Robert Ryan's performance is fantastic as he hears the casualty reports coming in. 90% destroyed, 40% out of action. He's pained by it, and because he loves these men, but it's what must be done because the plan will work. And I also love Hessler, played by Robert Ryan, figuring this trick out. He immediately sees this and has a column of his own tanks move over to the fuel depot without a moment's hesitation and it shows his utter competency as a military leader and also shows his experience above the younger soldiers because of his days in eastern on the eastern front again another parallel to the real colonel piper speaking of piper this film does a pretty good job depicting the malmedy massacre a horrific thing carried about by the ss 
because they didn't have the proper supplies to handle the prisoners, nor did they want to. They were evil people. It was utter murder of defenseless army prisoners and civilians, organized by one of the most evil men on Earth, and that is Colonel Piper of the SS. The film manages to depict well the rallying the massacre did to the American soldiers trapped by the Germans. What it fails at is the how. The film depicts Hessler, Piper for all intents and purposes, as being appalled by this act, also showing it rendering his, his destruction on the city and Blev, uh, which is another inaccuracy, inadequate. It is explained that this is done by the high command and not Hessler, when in reality, it was pretty much all of Piper's doing. He ordered those defenseless prisoners slaughtered. Yet, I do like the scene with Charles Bronson where he confronts Hessler over this and how Hessler can see what Bronson is doing immediately. But that isn't how it happened at all. Also on this subject, Hessler makes a little sense. Who does he work for? Is he in the Wehrmacht or is he in the SS? One scene, he's clearly wearing an SS black uniform inside his tank. Then there's a scene where he's talking to Bronson. He's wearing a Wehrmacht uniform. Now, that's a mistake in the costume department. I mean, at least it's a German uniform, still unlike certain Spanish films where the American uniforms are plain old Spanish. Cough, cough, I'm looking at you, Battle of the Last Panzer. To shift gears, to get the ball rolling again, I I'd like to mention the music by Benjamin Frankel. His score is just outstanding. It's rousing, it's big, it's loud. The use of the German military march perfectly depicts the Germans here. I love how the march goes from being rousing to desperate, especially when the, we first hear it at the beginning of the film to the last time we hear it at the end of the film. The first time we have Hessler seeing how young his tank officers are, his tank drivers, and so on and so forth, and yet we hear this music and it's inspired and it's patriotism for Germany. And then the last time is when Hessler is desperately trying to reach the fuel depot, even as his tanks and men are slaughtered around him. The theme is a perfect example of the of developing a, a musical score, having it start off rousing and ending in defeat and desperation. Actually, I take that back about the fuel being the best part of the film. The music certainly is. There's a whole bunch of things I can discuss in this episode, but it'd go on forever. It just seems that for everything I like in this movie, and I do mean genuinely like, it, it does something extremely, extremely stupid. To list what I like to round this out, the characters are fun despite not being based on real people. The cinematography is outstanding. The music perfectly fits not only the movie, but I honestly believe the real Battle of the Bulge itself. The fact they use real tanks, even if they are inaccurate ones, is not only impressive, but fucking epic. And yeah, I'll say it, the battle scenes are amazing be it the opening battle, the Siege of Amblev, or the final tank battle. It's all just fantastic. But it's all wrapped around the horrible inaccuracies. A desert? History blatantly ignored. The battle not being over 50 hours. It ignores Patton. It even ignores the British to the north who played a role in the battle. And it's in a fucking desert. I can't get over that. And yeah, that stuff... I just cannot ignore. These all change the feeling of the film and turns it into a film that baffles me. Why not make the battle up at this point? Make a completely fictitious battle. Like make this a big fake battle that didn't actually happen and not based on one of the last great hurrahs for Nazi Germany and one of the greatest dash worst moments in American military history. I don't know how to think of this movie. I just don't. And, and that's my conundrum. Do I watch this as a dumb movie? Do I watch this as a what not to do or a waste of dramatic potential? Do I actually sit back and say, damn, I actually like that? And the answer is yes. Yes to all of them. Because I find myself watching this movie far more than I should, given my preference to history and its dramatic potential. And every time I, I do watch Battle of the Bulge, I sincerely enjoy it for its craftsmanship, its fun characters, and, well, I'd listed the list above. So in one sense, yeah, I called Battle of the Bulge a good movie. Not amazing, but good and certainly entertaining. On another, I'd say it's one of the worst war films ever made for its blatant fabrication and ignorance of history. So I end with this. What do you think? Is it a fun movie? Is it a bad movie? 
And why do you think the way you think? Leave your comments below. So in the end, this is Adam Noyce of Anne Productions saying, Drop Dead. Thank you.